Congratulations. You have reached the Corona DSO 592 Exchange. Thank you.
And welcome back to All Hell Can't Stop Us. This is Jeff Cliff, and this is my weekly broadcast to the world, my weekly podcast and record of the time, an alternative to John Gormley here in Saskatchewan, as well as the IFPI, the ACE, the RIAA, the NPAA, and other corporate media. And today, unfortunately, I have no guests. I did try to reach out to a couple of people this week, and... I didn't really get very much of a response, so that's okay. I am here for you to give you, if not the truth, and if not what's going on in the world from my vantage point, at least the absence of blatant and open lies, which we have seen in the media this week. Oh my goodness. This week has been the week of the U.S. general election, and there has been a lot of things decided in a lot of different states that is worth perhaps going into in more American-focused shows, like, for example, decriminalization of various kinds of drugs, various kinds of legalization of various kinds of drugs, perhaps across a, a whole bunch of states. It's a very interesting topic, but not really the one that is of interest to most people. Uh, The one that's, of course, of interest to most people, as kind of alluded to by the chanting at the beginning of this show, is Donald Trump and whether or not he's going to continue to be the President of the United States. And there was actually a, a fairly good video that I'm going to link to after this show by a, a comedian, Awake with JP, which actually goes and runs through most of the scenarios that are still open for the U.S. government in terms of who is going to lead the executive branch and under what details. And if you're a U.S. politics person who's obsessed with that particular topic, that's probably the video to go watch. But I'm just going to point out that I have seen many, many media outlets from Business Insider to Forbes to BBC to Fox News to CNN over and over and over and over get this particular issue, if not wrong, then at least blurring the important details. And the important details are that, one, the vote for who gets to be the President of the United States is not decided by the general vote. How the U.S. government works is People go to the polls, they vote for their president, and then their states are assigned a certain number of votes in what's called the Electoral College. And this shouldn't be news to anyone who actually knows how the U.S. government works, but again, just as a kind of review for the rest of you, the Electoral College votes are what actually decides who becomes the president of the United States. And it happens when a group of people who are charged with roles as member of a real electoral college institution actually go out and vote and for some reason the news stations has been projecting how the electoral colleges in the united states is going to vote that's that's totally fair that's a a fair thing for the news to do and they're projecting that biden joe biden will take the electoral college vote when it happens on december the 14th which is in a couple of weeks actually it's over a month away so we have some time that a lot of things can happen in that month and in the meanwhile the vote even though it's projected in a certain way, based on how the population of the United States actually voted in practice, it hasn't happened yet. And for some reason, that detail has been blurred out of almost all of the coverage I've seen. Now, some of the more perhaps honest news sources that I've seen talk about this have mentioned that, oh, this is a projected score. Biden is projected to have a certain amount of electoral college votes. This is, of course, just a convenient fiction to work with while the details are still being sorted out. There are still, as mentioned in the JP Awake video, lawsuits that could yet determine how some of the Electoral College votes actually go. And there is still cheating that could happen on both sides of the US, which is another thing that is really amusing to watch as an outsider from the vantage point of someone who's not engaged in the U.S. electoral system, because it's pretty obvious from the outside that both sides, Team Red, Team Blue, the Republicans and the Democrats, have a long history of cheating in the U.S. general election, and that it shouldn't really be surprising when either of them do it, or even get caught, or don't get caught, etc., etc. The question isn't necessarily whether they're cheating, so much as which side is better at cheating, and better at not getting caught at this point. And... It may very well be that the Trumpist side is has overestimated their ability to cheat and get away with things like voter disenfranchisement laws and processes and having people in large caravans of vehicles blocking freeways in blue states and doing all kinds of things like that to keep people from voting who might vote for Biden. And those efforts look like they generally didn't work. And that regardless of how fair and accurate the vote count 
at the end of the general election this past week or so, the Democrats do seem to be in the lead in the general vote, and they do seem to be in the lead in terms of projected, as a consequence, electoral college votes that you would expect based on how people actually voted. However, in the United States, the way the U.S. government and the electoral college works is that for many states, the electoral college does not have to follow the vote of the people. It doesn't have to follow the will of the people. Some of them, some of the states it does, but not all of them, and enough of them that anything could still happen. We are still at step one in the U.S. election process as far as for what actually counts to electing a president. And for some reason that is a little beyond my comprehension this week, none of the major media in the United States has been talking about this. And I think part of it is to brush aside the details of how the government actually works to keep the public in the United States from actually understanding how little choice they have over who runs their country. That's part of it. I think one of the other parts of it is that the media has, or much of the past four years, been very against Donald Trump, especially media like the BBC, CBC here in Canada, the French uh, press, the CNN, etc., etc. This only surprising stations that have covered his capitulation have been stations like Fox News. And that may or very well be a strategic choice on their part. I personally don't trust Fox News as far as I can throw them. But this is an interesting point in that the major media across the board seems to be jumping on this bandwagon of, oh, it's already over, it's already done, the, the election is decided, and we don't have to worry about it anymore because Trump is gone, we're going to evict him, and there's no possibility of uh, Biden losing at this point, even though the Electoral College vote hasn't happened. And how many people would be surprised after all the jubilation and partying in the streets, which by the way, there's still a pandemic going on in the States, you guys. Why are you out in the streets in uh, large numbers of unrelated people? How many times do we have to tell you that you should not be in the streets with unrelated people in large numbers, whether or not you're Charlie Clark here in Saskatoon or the Team Blue in the United States? It really just blows my mind how not serious people are taking COVID at this point. And I understand Trump has not been taking COVID seriously from day one, pretty much. But the Democrats really have no excuse on this one. They know better than this. They know better than to go out into the streets and to party it up like this, or at least some of them do. Maybe the Black Lives Matter side has been kind of clueless on this from their day one, but still, the rest of you, you have really no excuse on this. So that's been going on this week. And it's just bewildering to watch the whole uh, coverage on the American side of the media, because in addition to missing the whole part of how the uh, Electoral College actually works and the fact that it hasn't made up their mind, two, I watched. There was like three or four stations. I happened to have a TV nearby me to watch it, and then I saw the American media cover the election, and they're talking about the votes, the tallying, and the the Trump side, the Biden side, and on and on and on. And in the meanwhile, if you go to It's Going Down, or Twitter, or any of the news sources that you can find that are on the ground, independent journalists covering what's actually going on in the streets, many, many of the cities across the United States, there were either riots, or the police beating people up, or large, large protests on election night or the night thereafter. And again, this is part of the effort, I think, to make sure that it's clear that Trump, at least as far as the government is concerned, understands how not welcome he is by the American people at this point. And there's a lot of people out on the streets and a lot of people getting roughed up by cops and uh, just brutalized. And the news, at least the stations I was watching, didn't even mention this while it was going on. It was like it didn't happen at all. It reminded me very much of some of the stories I've heard from the former Soviet republics before the Soviet Union fell, when there was protests in the street, there was riots, and there was all kinds of chaos going on, and the official news didn't even mention it. It was like it wasn't even happening. And that in order to find out about such things, you have to basically live in the places where this was going on. And even then, it was kind of hard to know, unless you were one of the people on the streets, seeing it for yourself, what was true and what was not. So the media has been lying by omission, by not covering this, one. Two, they've been lying about how the Electoral College works 
again, by omission, if by nothing else. Uh, some of them have been just blatantly talking as if Biden has become the president already or something like that. I mean, yes, it, I guess technically he's the president-elect, at least up until the Electoral College chooses their actual candidate, but this is an important detail in the age of Trump, right? We have a president that announced victory on his own side. Both sides, at the, the very beginning, announced that they had won in the, in the landslide. But the Trump side still hasn't conceded defeat. They're still taking the U.S. government and the electoral side to court to try to prove their claim. And from a, again, from an outsider's perspective, if you wanted to know what the true outcome of the election was, we shouldn't prejudge whether or not these lawsuits will succeed. Now, some of them will almost certainly. Some of the lawsuits have already not succeeded. And the, the judges in those particular lawsuits have practically lapped them out of court. And this may continue, right? But again, it's weird that virtually the entire media has either seen through the charade that is the Trump administration, or is just so eager to get on with it and to have their chosen darling as the next president of the United States, that they're willing to blur the truth a little bit on this and ignore details like it's not actually decided yet. And so it's weird that this is going on and that so much of this has been presented through the media in this way. And in the meanwhile, the weirdest thing I think about all of this is, so you have the media that's lying through their teeth on this and not covering what's actually going on. And you'd expect out of the Trumpist side that there would be something there that it should be a crisis for them, right? They're losing control. They're losing the grip on the country. And what is Trump doing? Trump is playing golf. QAnon has been basically silent. They link to this video of the last of the Mohicans, which, I mean, if that's not admitting defeat on QAnon's side, I don't even know what it is. They must have been compromised at some point earlier, possibly when that particular banker was arrested or found to be in the person publishing QAnon rather than, say, some kind of CIA insider or something. But that, so QAnon's basically out of the loop and thrown their hands up and given up. Trump is in his own little reality bubble, not really paying attention to what's going on. The Fox News has already capitulated. <laughs> we have InfoWars is slowly seems to be transitioning from claiming that the election results were fraudulent to Biden is actually in charge now. It's kind of weird how that sleight of hand is going. And so you, you have that side, the right just collapsing on its own, which is kind of interesting to watch. Somebody made a point that Mencius Moldbug made a post along the lines of one of the last things that President Trump can do is declassify uh, scores and scores of documents and basically pull a WikiLeaks on the entirety of the deep state and the entirety of the secret apparatus of the U.S. government, including the CIA, and fix the problem of an over-classification of data on what the U.S. government actually does in a one fell swoop as kind of his last dying act before he's dragged off to prison or whatever. And it's interesting that I think it's Donald Trump Jr. then echoed that, amplified that message to try to get Donald Trump to do that. Who knows if Trump is actually going to listen to his uh, son or whatever, but that's kind of an interesting thing to watch and to see who is paying attention to who on that. So that's the U.S. political situation in a nutshell. So while that's going on, the city of Saskatoon is having their election. And I was going to talk about the... I talked a little bit about the city election in episode 84, which I just finished editing. I'm slowly catching up on editing these podcasts and putting them up on YouTube and Mega and whatnot. But there is a city election in Saskatoon tomorrow. I thought, actually, it was on the 6th. For some reason, my notes were wrong on this one, and I showed up at the polling station, which was a school, and confused the hell out of the administration at the school, because there's this weird guy walking into the school when it was in the middle of the day on a weekday, but whatever, I managed to get out of that situation, but there is still an election coming up in a couple of days, and not much has changed since episode 84 in terms of, by the, the mayoral debate, it was pretty clear where the candidates stood on the important issues and what the important issues were i.e. issue number one is the bike lanes in the city and whether or not the city should care about doing anything about climate change at all and whether or not encouraging people to bike is worthwhile with Charlie Clark being one of the lone voices in favor of bike lanes and then everyone else being kind of against it which is really sad because 
I mean, I cycle to work, I cycle every day, it is how I get around and how I've always got around, and I try to lead by example on this and show people that, yes, it is possible to be an adult in Saskatoon to make a living and to work for a living and not just live in your parents' basement and get around by bicycle and to intentionally get around by bicycle. Not get around by bicycle because I have some kind of drunk driving record or something that I have to, but because I choose to and because it's the right thing to do if you're healthy enough to do it. Obviously, if you're in a wheelchair or something like that and you need to get around with a vehicle, there's some argument to be made that maybe it's worthwhile having a motor vehicle in that case. But for, if you're a young, healthy person, I don't think there is an excuse. I think you should have a bike and you should be biking around. Now, if you can't afford a bike, well, I mean, bikes can get pretty cheap in Saskatoon, especially if they like fall off the side of a trailer or something. But the point is that for most people who get around in Saskatoon, it's possible and it's a choice to not have a bicycle and to not bike to work. And most people don't think of it that way, but it is. And so it is sad that this election is going to be decided on the question of should we as a city care about this problem, this situation of climate change enough that we do something, even something as small as helping cyclists out. And so that is probably issue number one. Issue number two is the library. There's a big, it's like a, something like a $120 million library project that has been planned for at least a decade and is finally at the point where like the contracts are signed, the plans are there, the property's purchased, you can see it in downtown Saskatoon. And now the various candidates are realizing, oh, this is going to cost a lot of money. Let's pull the carpet out and incur a whole bunch of uh, God knows how much cost in getting out of these contracts. But regardless of that particular issue, there was one particular thread that I found kind of interesting that a candidate in this city would care to act in this way. So that, so basically how this thread, went, and I'll, I'll link to it after the show, is one of the people running for wards, uh, one of the, the ward positions, one of the elderman positions, turned out to also have a podcast in it. And they host their podcast on Spotify. Now, again, if you're listening to this on Spotify, because sometimes these episodes do get sucked up there, do disconnect. And don't give Spotify any money. Don't give them your mind. Don't give them your ears. Try to not listen to them. Try to find your music elsewhere to go out and find, maybe you'll go out and buy physical discs to play the way that people did for a good century before Spotify existed. We can have music in our life that isn't from this big corporate entity controlled by the RIAA. And it is important to reiterate that over and over and over again in every place where people are just mindlessly promoting Spotify because Spotify was a compromise made by the RIA in the post-Napster era to try to co-opt the attempt at using technology to share music and culture in a way that wasn't controlled by them. Spotify still is controlled by the RIA. It is still controlled by the, the same people that tried to sue the developers of technology and the developers of various businesses in the early internet days and who are still to this day and with their peers in Netflix and the MPAA doing things like, as I mentioned on my Facebook this week, trying to silence people using the DMCA from even talking negatively about their product, talking negatively about their movies, talking negatively about their music. This is the culture that a permission culture backed by the RIA can produce, is when you're afraid to even say bad things about something that you feel in your heart of hearts has corrupted the people around you or is, is causing deep social problems in your society, even then you're still afraid to say it because if you do, your tweets start getting censored, your account starts getting locked, your social life becomes impossible because you're unable to use something like Twitter or Facebook. And as mentioned again in episode 84, losing access to something like Twitter or Facebook can be a big deal. When the city of Saskatoon hosts their debate on Facebook, when the Saskatchewan provincial government links to YouTube and Facebook specifically for press conferences to allow you to understand what the rules are, whether you have to wear a mask or not, how many people you can have in your business or home. These kinds of questions are now being decided on the media of Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And so if you're kicked off because the MPAA or the RIAA, again, the same basic people who run Spotify are deciding that you no longer have a social life, you no longer have access to what the laws are in the place that you are living. Again, this, this is a huge problem. And so the way to get out of this problem, one of them is to not use Spotify and to not put up with people who use it 
as their it, it, just any means of sharing their media with you. And one of the people who did this is this Carol Reynolds, who's running for Ward 7. Now, it's interesting also on, on her side that she has been very open about standing up against the quote-unquote left and uh, the left agenda. And she seems to be very willing to stand up against uh, people like myself who consider themselves leftists. And yet when I go into her thread that she posts on a sponsored post, i.e. it's force-fed into the feeds of people across Facebook who have no interest whatsoever in her or her ideology, it's when we stand up against that and say, no, actually, posting links to Spotify is not okay. And if you're going to publicly support the RIA, which posting links to Spotify does, and then when challenged on it, when called on it, and you, someone points out, oh, hey, you're doing this wrong thing, you can do one of two things. You can either say, oh, I'm sorry, I did something wrong. I don't know enough about the technology. I don't know about the Spotify RIA thing. I just don't know. That, that would be one thing, but to not back down, that's something different, right? And so I called for people to vote against her as someone who's obviously not uh, supporting of the, the kind of free culture that I want to see in Saskatoon. And at that point, this is where the interesting thing happens. Uh, and from Carrie Tarasov, who's running for mayor here in Saskatoon, quote, Jeff, if you feel you need to bring down a female because you don't like her views, perhaps you should meet me in person. I can arrange for some real press to be present and you can spout off about how you will bully the majority of our population. Pause. And again, this is being giving a rough time to a politician, not the majority of the population, of course. Uh, a politician who's forcing their ad on the public, who did not ask for this ad, uh, who is forcing this link to a service that people shouldn't be using on the population, and then suddenly it's the people who complain who are the bullies. It's the left who are the bullies. It's the, the left who she's t openly talking about resisting who are the bullies. Isn't that interesting? Anyway, continuing on. Quote, I am sure that the press would love to meet you as well. Please advise when this is possible, and I will make all the press arrangements standing by for your comments. Quote, unquote. And I made a response uh, along the lines of basically, go ahead, provide me with an audience. I'd love it. Because... Who is this guy? This guy who's running for mayor who wants to what have a press conference and single a single citizen out who has an issue with some other politician? It's not even an issue with him personally. It's not even an issue with things that he wants to do in the city or things that he's doing. It's another politician. So he's somehow thinks that the press is going to give a damn about this with all of the important issues that Saskatoon has, with COVID and other crises affecting the city, and somehow I, Jeff Cliff, would be worthy of their attention? I cannot believe that someone who's running for public office would go to that extent, but this is what he did. And so this is the person who's running for mayor of Saskatoon, someone who wants to meet in person. Even if I was a troll, even if I was like a quote-unquote bully, right? Is that how we solve problems in this city? It, at the mayor level, is to, to meet people in person, quote-unquote? I have a hard time with that. And so, I mean, if it comes to that. But the other thing, too, is like, if it comes to that after the election, like, who is this guy? <laughs> other than running for mayor, I've never heard of him, personally. I mean, as mentioned in the episode 84, like, I, I think some of his ideas are valid. And I think that the safety concerns he's raised deserve serious attention by knowledgeable people in the city. And so if, if you're know people involved with civic engineering and who have the, the background capable of validating the things that he's saying about you know, the chlorine gas in this city, then by all means, people should be taking that seriously. And maybe that should have been the issue of this particular election. I don't even know. But to single out someone like that is kind of beyond the pale as far as I'm concerned. And so that is a the interesting thing. So there's that going on in the, that particular candidate. But of, of course, there are other candidates. We've got Rob Norris, who got caught apparently saying negative things about one of the other candidates, which I'm, again, is kind of like an outsider, uh, quasi-outsider again here in Saskatoon. Like, I don't personally see anything wrong with him saying negative things about the other candidates. If they're true, were they actually true? Were the things that Rob Norris was saying actually true? Does anybody give a damn about the truth anymore on things like Me Too, right? It, 
Or is it just that because he was bringing up uncomfortable things, that is that what we want to avoid? Is it that the media in this city are so afraid of real issues being discussed by people in the city that they are willing to snub a candidate like Rob Norris over it that they would normally be probably in favor of? I don't know. So that whole episode was kind of weird. I don't even know if I have a really good source for it, but it's just really bizarre to see. And it reminds me of, uh, there was at one point when I was back in high school, a stabbing in Bedford Road when I was still there. And the administration at the high school tried to make the claim that, oh, we're such a friendly, happy high school and everyone's friends and we're all a big family here and this sort of thing never happens here. And like, it, it just kind of reminds me of that with the way the media has covered this in terms of, oh, Saskatchewan is this nice, friendly place where we're all in these small towns and everyone knows everyone, or at least we all have the little town around us that we know the people in our lives. And it would it's just unbecoming of a politician to speak negatively of another politician. And, like, what planet are they living on? I mean, I've lived in small town. I've lived in big, well, at least what passes for a big city here in Saskatchewan. And in neither case does this bear any relationship to reality whatsoever. People talk about each other behind their back all the time. All the damn time. It just blows my mind how many people talk smack about each other in this province sometimes. And is the only difference that in Saskatchewan we don't do it in the media? And if so, what? how do we decide that? And, like, who is the media in Saskatchewan? I mean, we've got Post Media, we've got Gormley, and CBC. And we can't really trust the CBC to be straight on this issue because they've got this idealized version of what Saskatchewan is that we really can't take them seriously. Post Media, we've got... The, I mean, they took the Trudeau bailout money, so they're beholden to the government at this point, de facto. And then there's Gormley, which I don't know what he his comments were on this, but I would be kind of interested to find out. Uh, speaking of Gormley and Rolko, uh, I sent an email to Rolko about the Trudeau media bailouts. Because I wasn't sure. They seem to be a smaller, I mean, they're, they're pretty big as a media company, but they're small relative to, say, post media, for example and the U.S. media giants that you could probably compare them to. And I was wondering if they actually had taken up some of, and lapped up some of the bailout money from the Trudeau government that they gave to the media companies in this country a couple, what was it, a six months ago, a year ago, something along those lines, $600 million. Either way, it was a huge amount of money. It saved the newspaper industry from being dead earlier, <laughs> I guess. And so this is the email that they sent me in return uh, to my question of whether or not they took the bailout money. So quote, Mr. Cliff, I'm not sure, oh, this is, by the way, uh, Murray Wood uh, from Rocco. Uh, quote, I'm not sure what prompts the question, but private broadcasters don't qualify for the local journalism initiative. Isn't that interesting? That like, it's called a local journalism in initiative, but private broadcasters, i.e. local broadcasters, don't qualify. Isn't that interesting? But anyway, continuing. Quote, we occasionally see people assume the media is somehow in the prime minister's debt because the fund was established and is operated independently by an arm's life organization, which again, I would assume that. But quote, organizations that do qualify for the fund identify the stories created by those reporters you may have seen some of them in the Star Phoenix, for example, with a tagline at the bottom. A lot of small papers, I noticed, have received funding, but we do not. Here's the link if you want to learn more. And so I'll, I'll include that link where this video is posted. And so, good to know, right? Rocco, you can believe or not believe things that they say or content on their airwaves, but one thing that they don't seem to have taken is the, the federal government's bailout money uh, as far as the local journalism initiative is concerned. And that's a big deal because living in a country where all of the media is on the take from the federal government, whether it's an arm's length agency or not, it's still, you're dancing to the tune set by the narratives set by the federal government at the end of the day. They can pull your funding and they have in previous issues like the, what is it, the We uh, Charity, the SNC Lavalin. There's been a good couple of cases where the federal government has played a little fast and loose with ethics and being having people be beholden to them in ways that are not perhaps legal, ethical, or in ways that are basically openly corrupt. And when they're caught, they've been able to get away with it because there is no real oversight at this point, especially when we see stuff like Jagmeet Singh and the NDP vote against investigation into their wrongdoings, which is really going to burn the NDP's 
future chances. And I really would refer you to go back to the video I posted a couple uh, months ago about Jagmeet saying and uh, how the NDP should be forcing him to resign and throwing some backbone, etc. But the important thing here is that there is choice in media still. It is not a very big choice. We don't have a lot of options here as far as finding out what's going on in the world around us here in Saskatchewan. We do have Gormley and his one point of view. We've got the official narrative coming from Ottawa and the various news sources that are on the take from that. And I guess we've kind of got, I mean, to the extent Rolko and Gormley are separate, <laughs> I mean, there's that. And then there's stuff like small people on YouTube, present company included, right? There are other voices that you can get individual bits of information from, but we are kind of almost as much of a news desert as Thunder Bay was. And you can refer to previous shows as far as how that works. But I think we're getting close to the end here. There's an interesting article out of index.hu. There's basically a couple of newspapers around the world that I wanted to just briefly mention that news is having trouble all over the place. And it's not just Facebook and its uh, successful competition for eyeballs that news is dealing with, but active government repression around the world is happening to news sources. And it's not just politicians here in Saskatoon that are taking issue with independent voices. But So this is from Index.hu, quote, On Friday, the three leading editors of the Index, which is a newspaper in Hungary, quote, uh, Attila Toth Snesny, if I'm pronouncing that right, Veronica Monk, Janos has have initiated the termination of their employment at Index, followed by more than 70 journalists working at the site. The reason behind their decision was uh, that of the president of the board of Index.hu, uh, has fired former editor-in-chief uh, and Sazbolts Dahl, if I'm pronouncing that right, and has refused to reinstate him in order to secure the independence and future of the Index, despite the request from the editorial staff. So, on Wednesday, more their members of the staff have unanimously taken a stand by the dismissed editor-in-chief, describing the decision as unacceptable. And they then go into some of the details that they've been having problems for years, and that the dismissal is clear, quote, clear interference in the composition of the staff and an, quote, overt attempt to apply pressure at this newspaper, and that, quote, under these circumstances, following the decision, the editorial board deemed that the conditions for employment are no longer in place and have initiated termination of their employment. And then they list the particular journalists involved. So it's kind of interesting that, at least for this newspaper, that they're getting this interference with what they're doing. So what would people on the outside of this do? Now, if you're not in Hungary, you probably don't care about Hungarian news. It's just another newspaper far away. Why should anyone care, right? Well, these particular journalists now are, one, independent voices. And independently, we could go down the list and follow each and every one. If you're a person like me, that's what you'll do. But two, it's worthwhile for people outside of the normal context that they would normally operate in, outside of the community that this newspaper publishes in, to at this point take notice of what's going on in that particular community. To this point, take a little bit of a attention and just direct it. What exactly is going on in Hungary? that all these problems are happening to this particular newspaper. When a society loses their independent voices, the state that is supposed to be guarding the public from those in power, that's when bad things tend to happen. And so it really is up to us outside of Hungary to look at what's going on in Hungary to see, because they're failing at on their own. And I know there's a lot of garbage fires over here with the US election, with COVID, with internet censorship and all the other things that's going on. But if you are listening to this, and if you know someone who speaks Hungarian, perhaps, I know some of you are out there, it might be worthwhile just seeing if you can follow some of these journalists, because their voices may be saying interesting things right now. And that is how I'm going to end today. So if you have any questions, definitely post where this video has been posted or send me an email at jeffrey.cliff at gmail.com. And as usual, there is a subscribe star.com slash jeff dash cliff that you can help support this show and bring the spotlight of the world to other newspapers, perhaps, uh, that I might talk about later on, who are also being either shut down or are being interfered with by their 
uh, local power structures. And as media, we do all have to kind of look out for each other. So hopefully we can work together on that ground. And with that, no goodbyes, Dr. All right, I will end this stream for the day. So hopefully I will see you all next week. And um, enjoy the fireworks of the remains of the Trump administration, if it continues to falter. And I will see you all next week.